Good morning, good afternoon, good evening again, everyone. Today's um, session is a very special one in our summer school. It's not only a panel of um, the summer school, but it is also part of the Hanan Santa Cruz dialogues that are hosted um, by the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. And since it is such a special and unusual panel, we're very, very pleased to have our partners at the office represented here today. Um, Dr. Tutra Macy, who I'm going to hand over to in a moment, is the Chief of Partnerships and Constituency Building on Economic, Social and Development Issues. Um, and she works on a remarkably wide range of issues relating to human rights, including youth development and youth rights. And so it is particularly exciting to have her here this morning, but she's gonna introduce the dialogues and tell us a little bit about the office. Chitra, over to you. Uh, thank you, Dina. And thank you everybody for giving me this uh, opportunity to speak with all of you on behalf of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, warm greetings to each one of you in whatever time zone and location you are at. Um, um, I want to begin by actually thanking our partners. We've got long-standing partners who are there, who are part of the organizing team, which is the Global Network. And they've been our partners on the Hernan Santa Cruz series for some time now. We are also long-standing partners with UNEP, uh, a sister agency, but I'm also very delighted with this extension of a new partnership, and I hope that we will be doing a lot more with the university together. So first of all, my uh, sincere thanks to all of you, and I just want to take a few seconds. Um, I won't take too long. Uh, I don't have a prepared speech or anything, but I do want to emphasize two things. This year is the 75th birthday of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And we have seen events unfolding, um, um, celebrating, marking, um, and sometimes talking about the gaps left behind despite having 75 years of existence. This, as you know, is one of the most widely translated document in the world. And um, we need to acknowledge and recognize and celebrate the fact that this document brought together diverse voices from all over the world. It does not belong to any one specific part of the world. If there's a document that speaks to universality of human rights, I think it is really this document. Um, but uh, there is a great deal of... Uh, significance as we celebrate its 75th birthday that it remains in most parts an aspirational document still 75 years post being adopted and I think that's something that young people need to look into take up and see how we can make this a reality for uh, a lot more people than it is at the moment hopefully for everyone in the world and giving meaning to that mantra of leave no one behind. I also want to talk and bring in the Hernan Santa Cruz dialogues. Now the Hernan Santa Cruz dialogues are very much closely linked to the UDHR because when we were researching into the UDHR, we discovered that there were so many contributions from different parts of the world and yet they were not really being acknowledged or celebrated as much as, as, as they should be. And we found that one of the advocates who had been fighting very, very passionately for the inclusion of fundamental and economic social cultural rights was Hernan Santa Cruz, a Chilean diplomat. And so we decided to name the series that would enable a very constructive, um, a very um, invigorating and a transformative uh, platform that would allow for dialogue. And we've had three different um, formats of this dialogue and we find that the youth engagement that we do through these dialogues has been quite rewarding. It has been actually one of the biggest pleasures I've had over the last couple of months, uh, engaging with young people who've been part of this platform, either as speakers or as, or as participants, or people who've reached out to us following the discussion on things they could do locally and on things they could do at a national or a sub-national level. 
and we've been very happy to work with them. And I just want to say thank you very much. I know that in the chat, you have the link to the Hernan Santa Cruz Dialogues. Please uh, visit it. Please visit the OHCHR webpage and you will find that there is a lot that might be of interest to you. I'm looking forward to listening to this uh, dialogue today because you have a fantastic panel and I think it's going to be quite um, a wonderful opportunity to listen to so many experts uh, who will be sharing their views and experiences. So thank you very much. And on behalf of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, my thanks uh, again. And I look forward to being uh, a more long-term partner on the summer school as the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is a very important partnership to us too. We've loved being part of these dialogues and we're very pleased to be part of them again this year. So thanks for coming in and for making those comments. No further ado, Aoife, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Macy, and thank you um, to Dina as well. What an honor, not just to be part of this amazing summer winter school, but also to be part of the Hernan Santa Cruz Dialogues. Uh, it's just incredible. So uh, I'm Professor Aoife Daly. I'm from University College Cork in Ireland, and I specialize in children's rights, particularly children and environmental justice. And I uh, feel like I've put together a little bit of a children and environmental rights dream team this morning. Um, I'm so delighted that we have gathered together the group that we have to elaborate on how there have been so many transformations in the right to a healthy environment, uh, at least in part because of the um, incredible actions of children and youth and progressions in the arena of the international human rights um, of children and youth as well. Um, so just to very briefly outline, I will just very quickly tell you a little bit about my work and how children as actors have had this amazing transformation in the past few years at international um, human rights law level. Then I'll pass over to Freya, who's going to be talking about the right to a healthy environment and general comment 26, which you may be familiar with from the Committee on the Rights of the Child that came out just um, two weeks ago, actually, which is very exciting. Um, and Freya's from Washington University Law School. Then we were to have Mary Graff co-founder of Youth Negotiators Academy to talk about its negotiator program, but she is doing amazing things at a conference um, somewhere um, in uh, South Africa, I believe, but Vina is going to stand in. She's also from the Youth Negotiators Academy and tell us a little bit about that. So I'm um, delighted to have you, Vina. Very welcome. And then we're coming back to Ireland, to Deandra, who is a youth delegate at COP, and she's going to tell us a little bit about her experience of youth participation. Asteropi is then going to talk about child-led climate litigation generally, and then we're going to get nice and specific and go on to uh, Tanu, um, who is at the University of Stravanger in Norway, and she's going to tell us a bit about Sachi in particular, that child-led uh, petition from at the from the perspective of childist studies. So um, that is our lineup. Um, you can see we've got a lot of people who are uh, clamoring to talk, I think. So <clears throat> we're gonna try and keep everyone really tight, 10 minutes max. Um, so just to start with a little bit about my work, um, I will put a blog piece that I wrote in the chat because I'm not going to take too long because there's far more interesting and accomplished people than me um, who are lined up to speak today, including, you know, those that are actually doing youth climate action instead of just talking about it or maybe facilitating it sometimes. But um my work at the moment is really centering around how, okay, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, we're going to be talking about that a lot this morning. And it is this groundbreaking instrument. It lays out children's basic rights to be heard, to have their best interests prioritized in things like um, policy making. But there are many of us in children's rights that argue that this is actually quite a paternalistic document, or at the very least, that 
those of us who write about it, courts uh, where it's litigated, approach it in quite a paternalistic way or interpret it in a paternalistic way. And indeed, it was not drafted with any children involved in its drafting, which could have made a significant difference to what ended up being in there. It is ratified by every country in the world, by the way, except the US, but that's a whole panel in its own right. So let's not get into that. But it does indicate the levels of consensus that were there and the goodwill that was there. Um, but the best interest principle, which is really about adults deciding what's in children's interests at the end of the day, really is a disproportionate, I think, focus of children's rights. It's very useful for environmental rights, actually, because it can force states to have to think about children's best interests. But when adults are deciding children's best interests, that's adult led, that does not uh, include children oftentimes, especially when courts, judges are, are, are determining children's best interests. And even as we are overprotective of children, we fail to deliver in terms of lowering emissions to protect their interests and resources in the health and safety of the environment, in protecting um, their environment in the future. Um, so there is a lot of paternalism when it comes to children's rights. It's often well-meaning adults giving children their rights. And I think that's quite paternalistic. But I argue in my work that we're experiencing post paternalism. For the first time, we finally have a global movement of children um, coordinating together across the world, grassroots action as they advocate for the environment. It's an incredibly exciting time. I mean, I suppose it really was the Greta effect of about five years ago when Greta Thunberg started her kind of solo journey. But really, there was um, a world full of children, often indigenous children, Autumn Peltier in Canada, Vanessa Nakatu in Uganda, um, who were already doing this work. And uh, media was not giving them that same level of attention. But now we we have had extraordinary attention. It's obviously been um, stopped a little bit by COVID, but um, there is still effects of that explosion in media attention through, for example, the Saatchi petition to the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, the committee then going on to draft this general comment number 26. We have at COP27, we have now a platform, uh, particularly for children and youth. Children were directly involved in the COP negotiations for the first time last year. So it's an incredibly exciting time. And um, I have an entire project funded by the EU looking at children taking litigation, what their experiences are, looking at children that engage in climate action, um, how they uh, engage intergenerationally with the adults in their community and those kinds of things. There's a lot to be researched. There's a lot to be unpacked um, in this post-paternalist time. So that's um, all that I'm going to say about uh, my work today. And as I said, a blog post kind of outlining my thoughts and research on that and watch this space because I'm building a team of postdocs and PhDs and we're going to kind of research this exciting time of youth climate action together. So thank you very much for that and now I'm going to hand over to Freya Doty Wagner who's a fourth year doctoral candidate at Washington University Law School in St. Louis. I'm really looking forward to hear her hearing her telling us more about general comment number 26. Thank you so much Eva, and thank you to the DNHRE and uh, UNEP and everyone who's put this together. It's pretty sensational to be included as part of this, so thank you again. Um, I, I will just share my screen. I'm very sorry to interrupt Freya just while you're sharing your screen there. Just for uh, the audience, we're going to save our questions um, to the end. So we'll take them all together. But do please put your questions in the chat as we go if uh, anything comes to mind. Thank you. Okay, it is deciding not to work because why would it? <laughs> so, but that is fine. I will uh, be able to give you an overview without you being able to see things. Um, so I'm going to be talking about General Comment 26 today. Uh, like Ethan said, it was only published in full about two weeks ago. So this is very um, brand new information. Uh, and what I will be talking about uh, is in October 2021, the UNCRC committee 
um, invited comments on a general concept note um, about the general comment. And there were five aims uh, decided at the end of that um, about the general comment. And I'm going to be talking about those aims and seeing if they were actually implemented. So the first aim was to clarify the extent of states' obligations relating to climate change and children's rights, including with regard to mitigation and adaptation. Um, thankfully, they have done this. They were successful, I would argue. Um, they talk about specific rights under the convention within the general comment. So it talks about the right to non-discrimination uh, and how this relates to climate change. So um, they say that states have an obligation to effectively prevent, protect against and provide remedies for both direct and indirect environmental discrimination. It also talks about the obligation for, of states to respect, protect and fulfill children's rights. Um, the obligation for states to ensure a clean, healthy and sustainable environment in order to respect, protect and fulfill uh, children's rights more broadly. Uh, and this continues to talk about third parties. So I find this particularly interesting and novel because it talks about um, regulating business enterprises in relation to children and climate. Uh, it also talks about states, they need to have an, they have an obligation to take urgent steps um, to facilitate, promote, and provide for the enjoyment um, by children of their rights by um, hastening clean energy transition. So they're not just talking about what needs to be done more broadly, they're talking specifically about the different um, tactics we need to take, including um, sustainable use of water resources and um, using clean energy strategies. It also talks about an obligation um, to take appropriate preventative measures to protect children against foreseeable environmental harm. And it discusses the precautionary principle. Uh, and then also talks about an obligation um, to fulfill children's rights within the context of participation. So there is an obligation for children to be participatory actors in what happens to them within the context of climate change. The second aim was to emphasize the urgent need to address the adverse effects on environmental harm and climate change on children. The uh, word urgent or urgency is throughout the whole general comment, even in the introduction in paragraph one, it says that climate change is an urgent and systemic threat to children's rights globally. So if we want to see an example of uh, connecting climate change, children and urgency, it could not be more explicit than the first sentence. Um, it talks about urgency in the context of inter intergenerational equity and future generations. And whilst it is an urgent need for present generations, um, quote, children constantly arriving are also entitled to the realization of their human rights to the maximum extent. Also talks about urgency in the context of international cooperation and how climate change, pollution and biodiversity loss uh, clearly represent urgent examples of global threats to children's rights, um, requiring states to work together, um, in particular with historical and current major emitters doing the grunted work. Um, it also talks about the urgency regarding tipping points, uh, and it mentions specific tipping points that we ideally will not reach um, for the, the sake of uh, children and future generations and present generations of all individuals. And then specifically urgency regarding the harm. Um, it talks about this in the context of uh, the UNCRC and the right to non-discrimination, how um, states should collect disaggregated data to identify the differential effects of climate change and environmental harm on children to better understand intersectionalities and to pay special attention to children who are most at risk. So again, I think it's done a great job of doing uh, doing that and identifying what is urgent, what is present, what is pressing, and how this connects to children. Thirdly, it talks about clarifying the relationship between children's rights and the protection of ecosystems, biodiversity, and management of, and access to natural resources and states' child rights obligations pertaining to policies on these matters. Um, so clarifying the relationship between children, children's rights and climate change and surprisingly, this again has been done all throughout because the general comment would not be successful without doing so. And again, in the introduction, it talks about um, how the extent and magnitude of what they call the triple planetary crisis, which is the climate emergency, the collapse of biodiversity and pervasive pollution is an urgent and systemic threat to children's rights globally, like I mentioned before. 
and connecting this, um, they go through a list of specific rights under the Child Convention again, and how these are impacted by the climate change and how children's rights are being infringed because of environmental harm, um, which includes the right to life, survival and development, um, because environmental degradation, including through climate change, pollution and biodiversity loss, um, are closely linked to fundamental challenges impeding the realization of this right as they exacerbate poverty, inequality and conflict. Um, interestingly, they also talk about uh, the right to freedom from all forms of violence and conceptualize climate change and environmental harm as its own form of violence. It's a form of structural violence against children and can cause social collapse in communities and families. Um, it also talks about the right to the highest sustainable uh, attainable standard of health um, because climate change and biodiversity loss can exacerbate um, certain health conditions. Um, uh, and yeah, environmental factors often interact with these things. Uh, again, it talks about the, or next it talks about the rights of indigenous children and children belonging to minority groups and how indigenous children are disproportionately affected by biodiversity loss, pollution and climate change. Uh, it also talks about something I'm sure Aoife finds particularly interesting, the right to rest, play, leisure and recreation and how this is even impacted by climate change because um, something intrinsic to children's learning and holistic development uh, is the ability to explore and experience the natural world and biodiversity and how this benefits their mental health to do so. So, of course, it is a detriment to the mental health to not be able to do so. Um, there are two other clarifications and um, aims that they were hoping to do so, but I'm just going to talk about one more for sake of brevity. So clarity, um, they ask for clarification how children should be able to exercise their rights to information, participation and access to justice to protect against environmental harm. So thankfully, there is a whole section within the general comment talking about access to justice um, and specific uh, ways children can access remedies. Um, but they do this again within the context of specific rights as well. So it talks about the best interests of the child and how environmental uh, participation is, is within the best interest of the child um, because it provides opportunities for effective and meaningful participation. Um, unsurprisingly, also, it talks about this within the context of the right to be heard. Um, because free, uh, active, meaningful and effective participation uh, is, is vital to this cause. Um, and it also talks about this within uh, it being developmentally appropriate. So that these means should be accessible to children of all ages in ways that are accessible and appropriate, um, which is why there's also a general comment coming out in a few weeks time, uh, actually next week, that will be in child friendly language. Um, it also discusses access to information. Um, so children, parents and caregivers um, can access environmental information so they have a good understanding of what is happening, what they can do about it. Uh, and it goes even further and talks about environmental disinformation and how we should try and control and regulate this. So children um, are accessing safe spaces to be able to discuss things that are accurate. Um, and within this, it continues talking about the rights to education and how school curricula should be developed and altered to include climate change across the board, because it will impact um, virtually every aspect of their lives going forward without sudden change. And then in terms of access to justice and remedies specifically, um, quote, procedural elements, including access to information, participation in decision making and child friendly access to justice with effective remedies have equal importance to the empowerment of children, including through education to become agents of their own destiny. And this is really important within the context of paternalism, because we're really making children active participants. Children were in so included within the creation of this general comment, there were, I think, something like 16,000 children from over 100 countries um, included within this. And there's even a child youth uh, advisory board with part uh, of the creation of this and who will continue to be part of this moving forward. So I think the general comment has done a pretty sensational job so far of um, addressing those aims of making children both um, something to be protective and it's active participants. And I really look forward as um, we progress to see how other people feel about this and they might not be so optimistic, but 
uh, I feel good about it for now. So thank you so much for including me. I hope that was a, a good, albeit brief introduction to the general comment, and I look forward to hearing everyone else. Thank you. Thank you so much, Freya. Bang on time and what a whistle stop tour. I mean, you really hit on uh, so many of the crucial points about identifying what's urgent in that general comment, right down to climate change and structural violence. And the really important point that here we actually see post paternalism in action, doing children's rights differently thousands of children involved in the creation of the general comment and the general comment really being a result of children bringing attention to climate change in the media, onto the Saatchi petition, and then onto this general comment. We can see that trajectory. Um, so thank you so much for that, Freya. So next we're going to, um, well, I did see actually that Marie Claire entered the room, but either Marie Claire or Vina, <laughs> it's going to be a surprise, um, from the Youth Negotiators Academy to tell us a little bit about their work and youth climate action um, right, uh, right, right here. So Vina, thank you so much for joining us. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your work? And if you could keep it to 10 minutes, that would be so great. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much for um, having me join you all at the last minute. I'm coming on behalf of Marie Claire. Uh, so we're both co-founders of the Climate Youth Negotiator Program. Uh, we had started it last year, and um, this is our way of bridging gaps, bridging barriers that exist right now, the systemic inequalities that um, is... Uh, prevailing in in the in our um, work in climate action, we're talking about uh, a lot of different stakeholders being excluded from um, having their agents, like you know, uh, agency to fight for climate justice. Um, we talk about leave no one behind, but we're still leaving so many people behind. Um, and uh, currently, we have over sixty percent of the world's population that's below the age of thirty-five, and younger. I mean, and children uh, being almost half of that. So I think it is the right time to talk about all of this. Um, so, which is probably why um, we also started the Climate Youth Negotiator Program. I would love to tell you a little bit about what we do and how we emphasize on intergenerational equity and climate justice through the kind of work that we're doing. So, so. I mean, it's not a new uh, fight that we're fighting ever since the uh, convention, the UN Convention for Climate was set up uh, for the last 30 years. We've been talking about how young people need to be a part of not just advocacy spaces as observers inside the process, but also as a part of the decision making space, because they also have a role to play in the decisions that are being taken for their own future. However, I mean, this has been tried to be addressed by different people for the longest time. There's a lot of youth movements. We have a lot of young activists. We spoke about, we touched upon Greta and the movement that has started after Greta. But still, our leaders, our decision makers, they take pictures with the children. They take, you know, they listen to them. They uh, let the rest of the world know that, yes, we're working with this generation. We're working with the future generations. But when you see it at the decision-making tables, when you're sitting inside the cop spaces, you do not see, it's very homogeneous. People look alike. They are the same age category. They're uh, of a very specific gender. And um, it's really hard. Then how are we talking about climate justice, right? And we wanted to change that, but we wanted to work with the system and change the system because we've tried fighting against the system and it's not going to work. We wanted to, See, how could we change the inequalities that exist today by working along with them and trying to really understand what are the challenges and address all of the challenges together as a like, package deal. So if we gave them a deal that they can't refuse and if they still don't want to have rep good representation of children and young people as a part of decision-making spaces, that means that something is wrong. So this is probably how we wanted to take this forward and the program itself is therefore um, designed in a way to address challenges that we've heard from member states, different stakeholders to say, why are they not engaging with young people and children at the decision-making spaces? So the program is structured in four uh, key parts based on what we learned. And the first one is capacity building. Um, of course, as we know, 
I mean, what you know at a negotiation is super important. You need to know what has happened for the last 30 years. You need to know the right um, information. And um, it's also not just about then the thematic agenda items that are going into the COP process itself, but also the technical elements of how can you be a negotiator? What kind of confidence that, that you need to have to be a negotiator? Negotiations are still happening in English. So the communication skills that you need to have. So what we do is really build a very holistic program that touches upon all of this and not just the thematics that they need to know. The second bit uh, is funding. The biggest barrier that comes to the participation of young people and children in decision-making spaces is also somebody believing in them and funding them to be there. Because even if you have a badge, even if the country says that, okay, you can negotiate, the country does not have funding. And there are a lot of small and climate vulnerable countries where this is really true that they don't have funding for more than two people and if they only have funding for two people they're going to send somebody who has 30 years experience there's no other choice because if there are 20 different agenda items they need two people to cover it they need to have somebody who knows it all and they don't have the capacity to send somebody new so we wanted to remove that by saying okay we will fund everybody we train and if we did that would you then be ready to meaningfully engage them as a part of your country's negotiation teams, give them that negotiation mandate and put them at the seat at the, like give them uh, a seat at the table. So that's the second bit that we do. So we fund all of the negotiators that we train. The third is uh, community and network building. I've truly come to believe that negotiations and decision-making is more than, I mean, more than what you know, it's about who you know. And how are you able to influence them? And how are you able to bring consensus, build consensus amongst all of them? And this cannot happen in a day. It cannot happen, like you can't show up at a cop, you can't be at the table and you can't expect them to trust your decisions and opinions while you're just there because they don't know what your uh, agenda is. So what if we took that away and we took a step back and said, okay, we train everybody for six months and they're all going to be a part of a cohort and they're all learnings together. They're all growing together. They're exchanging about their countries, their positions, and what they're you know trying to move forward uh, with for the like COP or the COP after or whatever like decision making spaces that they're going to be involved in. This self sort of starts building. I mean, they start building trust amongst themselves. They're able to understand each other as humans. They know where they're coming from. They're able to build empathy. They're able to share stories. And for six months, they've just grown together that when they go into the decision making space, they understand that why and where somebody's coming from. And it's super then easy for them to start building consensus within the process. And also really having network to others who probably are not a part of the cohort, but let's say, okay, I want to talk to Christiana Figueres because I think I can learn enough from her on how I can change the process over here. So how can we make sure that we connect them to her or whoever they come and say? So that's something that we take as a big priority for ourselves. Say we will connect them to the right people that they need to have in their networks so they could influence the decisions that they, like the positions that they're coming with. And the last bit is, of course, advocacy, which is really prepping the ground for intergenerational leadership, intergenerational equity uh, within the decision-making spaces. We need to talk a lot. We need to bring a lot of people on board and bring them together to be a part of this moment along with us. Um, so we do extensive work on that. So this is how like the program itself um, is structured. And we realized through this, we were able to really mitigate a lot of the major challenges that we kept hearing from countries as to why they do not want to engage children and young people as a part of decision making space. Last year we worked with 26 countries across all of the UN regions and we trained 50 young negotiators for uh, COP27 who were there as a part of their country's delegations negotiating on behalf of their countries. Um, what's interesting is we've grown more than uh, twice this year so we're working with 54 and above countries uh, across again all of the UN regions and we're training over 130 negotiators of which we're funding 100 so we know that the 400 will certainly be there at COP28. Uh, probably in the history of UN climate negotiations this is probably the first time that you're going to have that many young people as a part of decision making space and we think it is super crucial for the movement like for everybody to come together and show that young people can be trusted, they can be decision makers and they can contribute to the decisions about their future too. 
having said that, um, I wanted to just like share a quick anecdote on uh, what had happened last week. So we had like, we have the series of conversations and dialogues that we hold with um, experts in different fields just to bring in intersectional topics and knowledge for the negotiators every week. And we had one session with uh, our lovely colleagues from SERI Secretariat, uh, David Boyd, uh, our, our friends from Save the Children, and also some of the children uh, campaigners that Save the Children work with. So the so they had brought them all together on a conversation with our young negotiators we're training. And it was absolutely, this is one of the best conversations that I've ever had because the young negotiators were representing their countries and their governments. They also sort of um, spoke to the children and heard the demands of the children directly. And they were able to really understand better. And I think that also got the young negotiators to reflect more on their own childhood and how things are changing and how it is important uh, like the landscape has changed, how that environmental consciousness is sort of built on like this positive and negative childhood memories and how they can sort of bring that back into the negotiations. Um, so we've also had a lot of resources shared by all of our partners, which has been like shared with the uh, negotiators. But apart from that, like including all of the papers that have been published, the, the General Comment 26 recently, everything. But in addition to that, what we also heard the negotiators say after listening to the children share their thoughts is they will consciously go forward into their communities, talk to their children in the communities and like take those demands to their governments as well as when they move forward in their um, uh, delegation duties as you know, as we approach COP and also further. And I think that was really beautiful to say that you get somebody to voluntarily come and say, no, this is important, I will do this. So it was really beautiful to see how uh, we were able to bring all of the actors together and we were able to sort of engage with um, um, young people and children together and see how we could have that sort of, um, let's say, even if, you know, they had like, experiencing differential effects of climate change, like children and young people still are very different, but we club them together. But then it was still nice to say that both wanted to learn from each other and see how they could take it forward together. Uh, with that, I will stop my monologue. I think I have sort of given most of the inputs that I want to, and I see a question in the chat. Is it okay if I take it? Absolutely, go ahead. Okay, so what were the experiences of youth negotiators of being at being at COP last year, did they feel engaged in hood? Yes. Okay. So I want to tell how we work. This would really help um answer this question. So we know that just because we train negotiators, we fund them, we get them there, there's the chance that the country can still say, okay, I don't trust this person. You train them, they know it, but as a part of our delegation, we can't have them, right? Like we can't have them as a part of decision makers with their making decisions for the country. So how we wanted to so how we've designed the program then is to work with the countries and the countries and us, we sign an, an agreement where we say, these are the things that we're going to do for you, which is train this young person, we build capacity for them we train, and we fund them, all of that. And in turn, we also have countries like listing out their deliverables, which is that they need to be given a negotiation mandate. And the moment you're given a negotiation mandate, you're equal to everybody else in that negotiation team. Of course, after that, it depends on how the team treats you can they uh do they integrate you properly do they put you on bringing coffee duty or like you know or they actually keep you over there and help with your learning experience however you know that your voice is equal to the rest which otherwise doesn't happen so they sign on that and we also then talk to them about how they could potentially and meaningfully engage them in their delegation duties prior to cop so that it's not just about being at cop because most of the work happens before COP is simply where you're just talking about everything that's happened over the year, which means that they need to be a part of the duty that, that they've been doing as a delegation for like at least three to six months before to be able to have some context to what's happened. So this is something that we all sign on, agree on. Now I don't, I can't say 100% everybody follows through, but that's where our team like really advocates and talks and tries to hold every country's hands and like really change the landscape and we've had some beautiful experience coming out of COP like including con um, including examples of consensus building where two different groupings um EOSIS and I think if I'm right uh, Latin America like um uh, ILAC 
they were not able to come to consensus on a particular point on the global goal on adaptations negotiation. We had two negotiators in these two groups and they since knew each other, they came together, they spoke about it, they were able to understand the demands from a very different perspective that they were then able to disseminate into their groups and there was consensus and they were able to move forward from that point that was stuck for hours on a day. I think that's a beautiful win. That's a beautiful highlight for us because this is exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to make sure that the outcomes from the negotiations are better and they're meaningful and they're not really stalled because we're not able to go forward. And it's also representative. And we're finally trying to, I mean, make sure that we're not leaving anybody behind in the process. Thank you so much, Bina. It's incredibly encouraging and heartening to hear about all the work that you're doing to have all of these young people as part of the decision-making space. It's a real, um, it's, it's incredibly new and incredibly important. And I was really struck by when you said that, you know, convincing people that you can do this. I mean, all that you need to convince people that children and young people uh, can be amazing change makers is to actually put them in the room together for adults who may be skeptical or older people, <clears throat> excuse me, who may be skeptical to see that. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and thanks Erin for your question as well and keep the questions coming. Um, for now, we will move on to our next speaker, another young, um, another young advocate for the environment, Deandra, who uh, is a youth delegate at COP also. Thanks so much, Deandra, for joining us. Thank you, Eva. Good morning, all. It is an absolute pleasure to be joining this panel today. My name is Deandra Nivukla. I am a youth advocate from Ireland with 12 years of experience at local, national and international levels. For context, I was a United Nations Youth Delegate for Ireland from September 2021 to 22. I am currently the European Economic and Social Committee's Youth Delegate to COP28 and COP29, and I'm also a Future Generations Global Ambassador with the Office of the Future Generations Commissioner for Wales and Foundations for Tomorrow. For the purposes of our discussion today, I'm going to share some practical thoughts and some barriers, building off some of what Avina has just said, which I loved, by the way, uh, kind of based on this international experience, because as I'm sure many of you are aware, having an agreement is one thing. Getting to a point where member states, governments, citizens, whoever it may be, agree that something should be a right. Compared to having that right implemented and enforced, it is an entirely different battle. And that's why you see so many children and young people as activists today. It's a battle which often falls to individuals and communities most impacted by human and environmental rights not being upheld. These are the same individuals and communities who have been historically and systematically excluded from institutions which were created for the protection of people and planet. We very rarely hear from those being really, really affected directly by these issues because this exclusion is often perpetrated on the basis of the very aspect that rights have been created for, whether we're talking about age, race, gender, sexuality, disability status, culture, religion, the list unfortunately goes on. I know our discussion today is to center on the progression of rights and trust me, not all of my experience has been bad. And I know it only scratches the surface of the experience of other young people. But I do think that it's integral to state how institutional legacies and harmful social norms are fundamentally preventing rights from being recognized, enforced and progressed. So to achieve these three things, we need a paradigm shift where inclusion, not just participation, where inclusion is not seen as an option or a tick the box exercise, but as an imperative so that human and environmental rights can be intrinsically linked. I personally can't imagine what kind of world we would be living in today if we had done that even 50 years ago, even 30 years ago. So I doubt any of us know what kind of world we could be living in in 50 years time if we just started today. It has been said before my contribution and I'm sure it will be said afterwards, but the change that children and young people have made, especially in the environmental sphere, is nothing short of extraordinary. I have personally only entered the activism climate space 
uh, climate activism space been in activism much longer, but the climate activism space in the past two years, because I was actually intimidated by the knowledge, understanding and determination of the young people around me. And I know I'm not the only one who's, who's feeling that way from conversations that I've had subsequently. Um, we know we, we knew that we needed to begin to be climate activists because of our intersectional knowledge, whether we were talking about gender equality or peace and security. These issues were exacerbating and being exacerbated by climate change. And just like we had this feeling that we needed to come together with another pool of activists, children and young people need to do the same. We have different strengths, we have different abilities, we probably have different opinions, and that's why we will be so strong together. Within the advocacy space, the youth advocacy space, there is a lot of competition beginning to build. And it was probably there underlying all along, but I think with the number of opportunities that are available to many of us today, and I suppose the social need to always have a speaking opportunity to attend all of the conferences that you possibly can, it's not allowing for much collaboration. And I think that might be one of the reasons why there is this disconnect between children and young people in the international setting. We are already fighting for space. We're already fighting to have our voices heard. And my next opinion might be quite controversial, but with conversations growing on the topic of future generations, I think this lack of space and this constant fight is a reason why it's been easier maybe for young people to advocate for the rights of future generations leapfrogging over advocating for the rights of children. Personally, I, I don't do my future generations work while forgetting about children. I recognize future generations and children as separate, but also that children have rights now, but also they will inherit rights later in life. Children have a planet now, but also a planet that they will inherit later in life, which undoubtedly will look a lot different from, from what it does today. And it can be very easy for anyone really, not just young people, to feel as though they can speak on behalf of future generations because the concept is widely considered as those not yet born and potentially get further opportunities from it. We know we can't do that for children, or at least that we shouldn't, as Professor Daly said earlier, because they have their own voice, they have their own opinions, ideas and agency. And it comes back to my point on inclusion. If meaningful space was opened up, if language was accessible and translated, I'm really looking forward to next week with the next general comment for you. If funding was widespread and equitable, competition would be severely reduced. We have seen what a constant need for competition and growth has done to our global economy and what that has done and continues to do to our environment. So it would be such a shame and honestly an injustice to allow the same to happen to our leaders of today and tomorrow. Young people don't have a convention like children do. We go from having children's rights to this awkward in-between period where we're not children but not yet adults to then having adult rights. I was very fortunate at the end of 2021 to negotiate the UN General Assembly resolution on policies and programs involving young people, which is due for renegotiation at the end of this year, but it is such an important document for young people concerning our rights. I was part of my national delegation, so I was enabled and encouraged to take the floor on behalf of Ireland and advocate for our foreign policy objectives, what they would look like within this text. And Irish foreign policy is very human rights based. So I was having the time of my life until we came to two specific paragraphs. And I will give a warning here for anybody listening. One paragraph discussed sexual and gender based violence during conflict and another dealt with pregnancies and health concerns, which can arise as a result of this abuse. Every other paragraph in this 10 page document where relevant stated women and girls men and boys, women and girls, men and boys. But these two paragraphs, girls and boys, were nowhere to be seen. This terminology obviously refers to children and young people, so apart from any of the other reasons why they should be included within this text specifically, it was my role to advocate for their inclusion and quite frankly recognition anyway. So I did, and I repeated myself multiple times, only to be chastised by two seasoned diplomats from two separate non-like-minded member states who didn't like that I was a woman and a young person trying to change language which had been agreed two years previous and who didn't want to admit that these crimes were being perpetrated against children and young people 
purposefully ignoring the reality and struggle of thousands. Whenever something like this happens, I find my strength and motivation to keep working based on how I think the situation would go for someone who isn't me, because that's who I want to change things for. I was recently at the UN again as an individual this time and was shouted at in public on two occasions by a security guard, literally because of the badge that I had been approved to enter and be in the UN with. What if it was my first time there? What if it was my first time in the US? What if I didn't speak English fluently? What if I was a child and not a young person or a younger young person because I'm technically not a young person, I don't think anymore according to many of the definitions. Either of these situations could be enough for someone to say, no, that's enough for me. I don't belong in this space and just disengage entirely. As activists, we put ourselves out there because something is wrong. Our rights are not being upheld or we simply don't have any rights or our voices aren't being heard or we and the work that we are doing is not being taken seriously. We shouldn't have to leave prematurely because we're like before we're able to make any improvements because we have literally been forced out of the system. I like we have heard and I'm sure we'll, we will continue to hear about some brilliant examples about how children and young people are changing our world and our environment for the better. But unless we make our decision making institutions accessible and inclusive, unless we eliminate competition between and among children and young people and start working towards acceptance, collaboration and partnership, we run a real risk of losing some of the best human and environmental rights defenders ever known. We need to continue to empower, encourage, and empathize with children and young people to drive collective action forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deandra, and you've raised incredibly important points there, I think. it's. Um, really hard to hear about, you know, some of these um, experiences of aggression. But I mean, we've seen very clearly in the media, especially uh, aggression towards young female activists um, who seem to trigger certain demographics of the population, shall we say, uh, re receiving just horrendous um uh, you know, abuse and bullying. Um, and it's really hard to hear that, but it's all the more important to be reminded, you know, as allies of children and young people in this space, how important it is to be supportive, to ensure that there's not burnout, that we're not asking too much of you. Um, and uh, so many other important points in there as well. Um, for example, you know, we've talked about it before, Deandra, haven't we, about the leapfrogging of, of, of younger children sometimes, um, including their rights in being explicit in climate cases. And I've written a little bit about that. I've put, just put it in the chat of a journal article coming out on, on that this month, how um, it's interesting how actually the CRC is not actually very present in many national climate cases, for example, even though children and young people might be um, the face of some of these, or, or at least the identity, the legal identity of some of these cases. Anyway, thank you so much for that. Now, our next speaker is Aster Opie. I'm very excited to hear um, the trends of climate-led, or sorry, child-led, I should say, climate litigation. Um, so over to you, Aster Opie. Thank you very much, Aoife, and thank you very much to the organizers of the Slammer Winter School and to Eva for putting together such a fascinating panel. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, so today I will uh, share some, uh, some of my latest work on children's rights and climate change litigation, um, and I will quickly share my slides, if that will work for me, hopefully. Thank you, that's coming through great. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, so again, it's a pleasure to be here. So the focus of my talk today will be just to um, investigate a little bit the trends of child-led climate litigation across jurisdictions and the variability that characterizes them and what this means for uh, child participation in these cases. Uh, of course, I should extend my thanks to a number of people and institutions who support my research, but most importantly, to the young leaders such as Deandra, Vina, Marie-Claire, who inspired the conception of this research project. 
Um, so uh, the uh, impact of climate change on children's well-being um, is evident and has been reported multiple times in scientific uh, writing. And I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on these two uh, slides, but it's important to um, highlight that the impact of climate change on children's health is disproportionate compared to adults, and that is for various reasons, including their various developmental uh, stages um, and also their developing knowledge, their dependence on adults uh, who are not always doing a very good job. And um, also that the impact is not um, restricted to children's physical health. So children's um, social, mental and participatory health, if we could use this term, is, is very much um, affected uh, by climate change. And um, this does not only have to do with um, a, a number of disorders, including depression and substance abuse, trauma, but it's an overall negative effect on their social, moral and spiritual well-being and all the rights um, that are affected by this as a result. So if we wanted to really um, um, discuss the climate and children's rights crisis in four lines, for me, it would be that climate change has a disproportionate impact on children's uh, health and well-being. This causes multiple continuous violations of their rights and their traditional exclusion from decision making, as already highlighted uh, from Blayandra and Vina and previous speakers, is only making the situation worse. Um, so what was the children's response to this situation was to go to the courts and they are pretty serious. So if we wanted to have a look at how uh, child led or maybe child focus, if I say that uh, um, litigation looks like, we can have a look at this map, which I have color coded um, according to how many cases have been submitted to different jurisdictions. So we can see that the most of them are submitted in the United States, followed by Canada and Germany. Then we have more cases um, in the third place by um, uh, children and youth in Australia, Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, and generally uh, Central and South America is uh, presenting a thicker emerging trend um, of child-focused cases. Uh, then we have fewer cases in other jurisdictions, but are there for the very first time, such as in South Korea, India, Pakistan, um, a few cases in Europe, and all these are national cases. So on top of these, we have cases at the regional states um, before the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, we have petitions before the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, and also cases before the committee um, a couple of years ago. Um, so what is um, interesting about this map um, and we should note is that all these cases are very, very different. And um, actually, I should note that uh, these are absolute numbers uh, that I use for the map. So if we wanted to make a more accurate comparison of how many cases are in which jurisdiction, we could convert the data to cases per capita. Um, so uh, going into the um, content of these cases, we can see that they are extremely different. And I'm not talking only um, um, about the, the different bases for the legal action. So we can see cases that they are relying more on constitutional protections of rights, other that they use other doctrines, such as the public trust doctrine, um, along with uh, arguments based on future generations. Um, I am talking also about the children's rights culture uh, that they bring with them or its absence. Um, so we can see that uh, depending on whether uh, the jurisdiction um, of a specific case has um, an underpinning or supportive uh, children's rights movement, or they, it has a very strong or stronger or weak children's rights culture generally, uh, we can see differences in the arguments made uh, in the cases examined. Um, another differentiating factor is how these cases are interpreted and displayed in the national media. Um, so if uh, we can actually have a very good um, uh, a sneak peek, if we watch uh, uh, news in um, national languages and how they are uh, explaining to the world that may may not know exactly about the children's rights movement or the child focus climate cases, how children are breaking these cases to the courts. And uh, we can see, um, you know, the, in, in the language use, uh, if there is criticism, if there is a uh, belief in the children. Um, and so it is very interesting point um, to explore further. Um, in, at the regional states, we see uh, that the cases submitted so far invoke a combination of rights, um, such as Article 2 uh, on right to life, 8, privacy, and 14, discrimination. Um, and then we have um, also another interesting trend, um, uh, because um, I have seen so far, and uh, I have noted um, in peer discussions, that there is this powerful trend of children and youth submitted cases. 
But there is also another interesting trend, which is children and youth from climate vulnerable jurisdiction not submitting cases. So um, it will be interesting to explore further uh, why specific jurisdictions and uh, Greece um, is one example, which are particularly climate vulnerable, do not have uh, to date um, child focus cases. Um, as I said, this has to do with the differentiating uh, factors and the combination of those. Um, when it comes to the content and the arguments uh, of the um, um, of children and petitioners and the youth that they are present to the court, uh, the situation gets a little bit uh, uh, confused. So I have used two examples uh, of two constitutional claims, the New Bauer versus Germany and the Duhim Kim in South Korea, uh, which were submitted um, approximately the same time, 2020, only one month apart. So the scientific knowledge was uh, approximately at the same level, we can say. Um, and the arguments presented by the petitioners are very, very different. So looking closely at uh, New Bauer, we can see that the arguments based on future generation are more than double uh, than the arguments actually used for children how much the petition, the complaint, um, focused on the, the experiences of children in the here and now. And this has been um, um, also discussed by um, um, Ifa in her article, which I read and I found very interesting, uh, but also by Diandra and uh, Vina, um, you know, how many uh, cases actually address and in which detail the experiences of children in the here and now. Is it more convenient to focus on the rights of future generations because they are not here uh, if we discuss uh, a definition that are, you know, those not yet born. So they cannot contribute to the discussion. So it's, it's, it's an easy, really, task, much easier um, than negotiate in detail uh, with children about how they feel and really listen to them. Um, when we look at Duhim Kim uh, versus South Korea, the situation gets even more interesting because by counting the numbers that it refers to the next generation, um, we had fewer references than it has to the younger generation which uh, was used to um, mean children. But then um, when we look very, very closely, we see that the petitioners, when we use, when they use younger generation, actually they understand younger generation to be, to be the future generation. So although at the first glance we say, oh, actually this uh, complaint makes a better work because we can see more references to younger generation uh, who are already here, then we see phrases that are quite confusing, such as that the adult generation gives a very tragic present to the younger generation. It's like, this is for present generations, future generations, younger generations, it's quite confusing. So if we count the times that they identify younger generation as part of the future generation, then the references are a little bit on an equal basis. But this is of course down to interpretation and you can see why this can get quite confusing. Um, this inherent variability and the different uh, factors and um, aspects that are highlighted in child-focused climate litigation uh, uh, makes uh, our work um, of those that they want to investigate child participation quite difficult uh, because um, there is, um, of course, participation of children, um, uh, at least in principle. But then when we look at the cases, their involvement is very, very varied. So we have a huge spectrum of children participating either directly and they're invited to oral hearings, as was in Sati. And then we have children that we do not exactly know how they, involved, how they were involved in the case and how they contributed uh, to it. Also, at the same time, we do not have many opportunities to witness child participation in court. Um, some cases that are very interesting are um, dismissed at the procedural states. Uh, although this may be for good reasons, um, this is debatable, but again, uh, it makes uh, uh, child participation scholars' life quite uh, difficult. Uh, on top of, that, of this, we have a generally legally disruptive uh, fieldwork um, um, that we found ourselves in. Uh, climate change is, pushes us, is pushing us to evaluate our norms, our methods, um, and this has been identified and stressed by Fisher and other scholars. And uh, so we really are found, find ourselves in a new territory uh, this is not getting any easier by uh, us not agreeing on what participation means. So, um, oh, too fast. So, um, across cultures and languages and scholars, um, we don't necessarily um, say and mean the same thing by saying participation. 
And uh, from peer discussions, what I've noted is that we use this word participation as it has a self-explanatory meaning, but it doesn't. And I guess that between children and adults, this is, is even worse. So I am uh, very skeptical about the fact that many um, adults represent children because I'm not too sure if they are even um, ever competent enough uh, or in the, same, in the perfect place um, of their life only because they are adults and they are very far away from childhood uh, to understand and accurately transfer um, children's uh, um, uh, views. So this is my uh, timer that I am talking too much. Uh, so um, uh, overall, I think that um, some conclusions um, that climate change having a disproportionate impact on children's lives and children going to courts may be understood as um, a good thing because they are going to force and they are making themselves very uh, present and very active. And maybe this is a, an opportunity uh, to be made from this very uh, difficult situation to be applied to, to different contexts that are not climate specific. Um, we see a very uh, wild variability, if I say, when it comes to children cases submitted nationally. Uh, there is no fixed pattern when it comes to invoking children's rights. If I mentioned already that the CRC is barely mentioned or used to its full extent, and therefore all these things challenge child uh, participation. So what we need is actually to collaborate uh, with scholars, in my opinion, across disciplines, because I don't think this is a legal issue, this is a social issue, it is also a health issue, so we need to bring together different scholars and uh, from childhood studies as well, and to just discuss all of these challenging issues, and to this table, children must take uh, precedence. Um, so thank you so much for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, contact me, and I look forward to your thoughts. Thanks so much, Astaropi. And, you know, what a great kind of lead on and intersection between the points that we're making. There's exciting things happening. There's disruption happening in the legal arena and elsewhere. But we see trends that maybe we wouldn't have expected, like the CRC not being so prominent in the cases. We see trends that we would have expected, like questions around how much are children actually being able to be involved or facilitated to be involved and how child-friendly are these justice systems. So thank you, I found that absolutely fascinating. So now we'll move on to thank you so much, Tanu, for hanging on. But I just um, love that we're now getting some, you know, more in-depth reflection on one of these many climate actions um, so I'll uh, hand over to you now, Tanu. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, honored to be here. And uh, thank you very much, Eva, for organizing this and bringing us uh, all together. Uh, I'm uh, Tanu Biswas. I'm a philosopher, uh, a childist uh, philosopher to be specific, and we're going to be talking a little bit, uh, thinking about this uh, today. My uh, the, the talk, uh, the presentation is uh, titled on uh, becoming uh, good ancestors, a childist a reading of uh, Saatchi et al. versus Argentina et al. 2019. Uh, uh, the case has been mentioned already. I uh, uh, request you to please look it up uh, if uh, for those who might not have seen it uh, as yet. And uh, I also want to um, emphasize that I, I mean, I'm, I'm speaking alone here, uh, but I am uh, presenting uh, with uh, the Norwegian anthropologist Thomas uh, Heland Eriksson, who I've been thinking with and, and writing with. Thomas is uh, fighting cancer uh, for many years now and, uh, it, you know, has uh, the, the connection, uh, therefore, is still, but it's still strong, although he's not always uh, present uh, when we think and write. Uh, but uh, so, and Thomas's uh, concept of overheating is going to be part of what I uh, talk about. Um, uh, childism, just to give you this, uh, so there are going to be three things I will br very briefly mention, and now it's in the chat. Uh, uh, so to have like a background, but so very briefly, childism, 
um, is like feminism, uh, but from the perspective of children and uh, childhood. And it goes beyond feminism because feminism, uh, you know, deconstructs critiques and uh, uh, challenges uh, patriarchy, which is about the adult father or partner. So there's a uh, childism that's where it steps in. And I would also argue that decoloniality, childism, um, uh, extends the decolonial project, which also by and large, as I understand it has still been a lot about, uh, you know, the adults and, um, you know, it's not possible to oppress or other uh, even indigenous, uh, you know, people of color, uh, formerly colonized uh, peoples, uh, without having an image of a primitive child. So you you need this kind of image or imagination of uh, a being who can be infantilized. You know, so this is the kind of adultism uh, which, both conceptually and uh, as what we've been listening to, uh, that's the kind of adultism that childism is is preoccupied uh, with deconstruction and uh, challenging. Uh, overheating, Thomas Heland Erickson's uh, concept, uh, is not only about the climate crisis. The climate crisis is a very big part of it, uh, but that it goes together with the economic crisis uh, and also, uh, you know, let's call it the identity or cultural uh, crisis. So the right of right wing and, and so on and, and how these three kind of come together. So we must understand uh, climate as, as part of this and overheating is uh, basically the metaphor uh, to talk about our current era. And uh, Thomas argued in his earlier uh, analysis of overheating that there's a double bind of our era in overheating, which is very simply put, should we make more money or should we save the planet, you know? And some would argue we can do both and uh, I uh, fail to still see how that's possible. Uh, but uh, the childist reading on, when say, on becoming good ancestors, we bring in a third dimension. And here, this is thanks to the children and young people who've been inspiring us in what AFA calls the post-paternalist uh, uh, time. And uh, that's what, for me, childism is too. What can we learn? You know, and how can we philosophically learn uh, from uh, children? Um, and uh, these collective voices uh, that we see in the case, uh, uh, Sachi, it's all they've been beckoning us to slow down, scale down, and cool down, and ask how can we live and govern in ways that will ensure a decent and meaningful livelihood for our grandchildren and their grandchildren. Uh, and you know, there are the declining population in many countries by some demographers, which is projected as a, a global trend, uh, has complex causes, but it is noteworthy that many young climate activists consider not having children, uh, owing to their dilemmas, uh, you know, uh, and the dismissal of the future of the planet. And it, we don't know how their futures are going to be, but it does give us uh, a very, you know, a valuable variety of philosophical insights or philosophical uh, ethics and reasoning, uh, which has not previously been part of um, and the way we've understood uh, struggle. And there is an intergenerational uh, responsibility there. So a bit about the, the triple uh, blind uh, of, of overheating. Uh, but before I come to uh, uh, that in the conclusion, I just want to talk a bit about what does what are the you know let's say the philosophical aspects uh, and the richness that this case uh, Sachi et al reveals. So if you read the testimonies, which you go to the case and there are going to be testimonies by, uh, there were 16 originally, uh, but um, Ellen, the youngest uh, one, as she pulled out uh, the indigenous uh, Sami um, uh, uh, participant from uh, Sweden. So there are 15 testimonies, and if you go through these. What we saw is there is an unusually sophisticated ethical reasoning underlying the sociopolitical reasons for choosing climate activism, advocacy, and litigation. 
and there's a profound concern for the temporal horizons of lives beyond their own, and that's noteworthy. You know, so there's something to learn for uh, for us, and this is uh, a, it, and that's remarkable because the Child Rights Convention itself doesn't refer to future generations. You know, uh, so it's 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 inc excellent uh, this uh, point, and I, I have to say there's philosophical wealth there for. Uh, our, uh, you know, times where I have to say it's hard uh, thinking in terms of saying, how can we be good ancestors? How can I live in ways today that so that the future generations, you know, will think of me a little bit <laughs> as uh, having contributed to um, not making their lives uh, difficult. Um, many of the plaintiffs also um, as I've mentioned, they they express a conscious choice of distancing themselves from potential desires of having their own children. You know, so it's it they're you know it's like you put aside that desire, even if it comes up, you're like, no, I'm going to think of some other more important things right now. Um, and and there's a deep sense of uh, uh, a sense of deep interdependence, uh, which is a concept that childist. Uh, thinking would, uh, you know, also expand on. And this deep interdependence and connection is evident from both a spatial point of view, uh, because uh, the plaintiffs don't see, this is what's excellent, you know, incredible about the case. It's a transnational case. They're not going country-wise. They could have gone, you know, there are many national cases, but they come together as a transnational collective, and they are arguing that, you know, they're contextualizing the local experience in the global and planetary context. Um, it's not a new argument, but it's worthwhile that a case like this comes uh, forth. So uh, there is the, the need for transnational cooperation is emphasized uh, both, uh, you know, through the case itself, but also to the testimonies. Uh, and then you have, uh, uh, and, and they're not saying the governments alone, like each have to do it. They do bring in other actors in, in the insights that they give. And uh, then there are other uh, aspects of how the existential dimension. So there's an existential interconnectedness as well, because these existential dimensions of the crisis have uh, for, you know, uh, children that time, because when the case was filed, uh, they were all children. That's why I'm using the word uh, children. Um, the, that there is a deep sense of empathy and connection with children in the global south as well. So it, it is creating a sense of solidarity at that level. And uh, there is another level of incredible and noteworthy sense of connection with the what one could call an inner self, uh, because uh, activists are very aware of the strong emotional and psychological you know uh, processes they are going through a broad range of emotional and psychological challenges from fear sadness disappointment anger uncertainty depression trauma uh, you know all of that is there uh, but then there's a high degree of resilience it's incredible uh, and, and agents there's a resilient agency we call it um, and because they're not demotivated especially the activists in the in the global south you know the the indigenous activists from Palau, for example, um, they're not demotivated even by some serious, uh, you know, uh, health conditions, and they're going on. Um, and they, what they do is introduce a game-changing premise, uh, you know, in the climate debates and policy that the climate it is a children's rights uh, crisis. Uh, that's that's an important premise that has come in, uh, and uh, what we extrapolate from this premise is uh, that that this is defining the challenge of overheating. That I um, and uh, that overheating is more than a double bind. It's not just about should we you know say uh, make more money or save money or save the planet, uh, but there's a triple bind, which is it's not just about growth versus sustainability, uh, you know, short term versus long term, it's just not that. But it entails finding a balance between economic and environmental sustainability in a way that ensures that the basic human rights of children, um, such as right to life, health, uh, culture, and the best interests are guaranteed. So that's where the triple bind comes in. And uh, it's, uh, you know, thanks to the work 
of uh, uh, these children and, and activists that uh, I would say this, this philosophical inspiration uh, uh, is, is possible and uh, gives us some uh, motivation as well at uh, deeper levels to think about uh, questions like how can we be, uh, become good ancestors in the present. Thank you, Tanu. Um, what an amazing way to wrap up our um, talk. I mean, you've just touched on so many um, profound points and, you know, that those of us that are not philosophers may have missed, you know, in the nature of the application and in the insistence on transnational cooperation, the deep um a sense of um, connection to the global south and, and indeed, you know, invoking the rights of Indigenous children in the relevant provision of the CRC Article 31 was something that really stood out. You know, there's not a lot of applications have been made, actually, to, to the committee at all. And there's certainly none like this, very transnational children from all over the world, invoking things like the right mm -hmm. of indigenous children to their culture. Um, so I think that is a wonderful place to just check if we have any questions. And also before we take the questions, um, we don't have time for a lot, but we have time, I think for a couple, if, if that's okay, Dina. Um, just to say that if there are any children and young people who are engaging with us in, in this session now, um, and you feel like getting involved, um, you can get in touch. Uh, Dr. Macy was suggesting that, you know, the youth engagement program would be really happy to hear from you. You can just drop me an email. There's my email address there, and I'll forward it on to the um, to, to the relevant people. So do we have any questions um, at this point from, from anyone in the audience might want to ask verbally? I don't see any questions in the chat, but maybe while people are warming up, I can start us off with a bit of a question. Um, <clears throat> I've just been thinking about uh, one of the panelists sort of talked about um, the importance of sort of in inclusion and, and child-led um, thinking without creating an unbearable burden. Um, and of course, the climate crisis is not one crisis, you know, no, no crisis is one crisis. So, so, so we, we live in a time of intersecting and overlapping crises, each of which have their own kind of complex temporal dimensions of affecting people at different points of their lives in different ways. But children are, of course, also affected by the cost of living crisis or the housing crisis or the, um, unemployment crisis or you know the manifestations of crisis that we think about in the, as kind of being um grown up I guess in some ways and so I suppose my question is about about how we um in this post-paternalist world of understanding sort of children as activists and actors in lawmaking how we sort of relieve burdens while also kind of necessitating the engagement of children living in a world of intersecting crisis. Um, and maybe that's an overwhelming question. Maybe that's not a question that's easy to answer. And, and, but I think also when you're thinking about the kind of space between youth activism and children activism, you know, like, like who bears that burden and when in their lives feels like a very critical part in sort of thinking about and imagining a world in which children get to participate and engage and be in spaces of international lawmaking without having their lives subsumed and consumed in just kind of reacting and activism in a moment of multiple crises. 
it's such it's such a great question dina you know uh, it's we don't want to slip back into the paternalizing oh children need to have this perfect childhood that we know no child does and every child has challenges but at the same time we can see can't we really clearly that this is a burden children are having to do really a lot and carry a lot of stuff um so i think probably maybe one of our um youth representatives if you wouldn't mind speaking to that a little bit. Um, I can pop in. I have a work meeting that I couldn't uh, reschedule in one minute and I need to start the Zoom for it. So very quickly, um, for me, I think it is, it's it's a major conversation that we need to be happening and uh, that we need to be having. And it's one that I had with an Irish politician lately who has two sons and he's pushing a future generations bill through, well, trying to push it through parliament. Um, and we were talking about eco-anxiety because it is such a big thing for children and young people. And I think it's something that can also, you know, make them not want to engage with the space. And there is so many things that are so overwhelming that are going on in the world that we really do need to protect, as many of our speakers have said today, children's mental health and young people's mental health. Um, for me, it's it's the language that we're using. I work within the youth work sector in Ireland and some a phrase that we use very often is meeting young people where they're at so we need to meet children where they are at we have to have a knowledge we need to work across different sectors we need to work with philosophers and psychologists and all these different people to understand how a child would understand the world and we need to just speak to them i think we always overlook speaking to people and the interaction that you can get from that and what you can learn and how you can then help people with that um, and I think the second thing then for me as well would be education. We need to filter through some kind of, I mean, I mean, mental health definitely needs to be part of education much more than it ever has been featured before. Um, and we need to be dealing with these issues in a child and youth friendly way through education, whether that is formal or non-formal education. We need to be able to reach children no matter what level they are at and yeah, that, that would be my contribution. And I am very sorry to have to pop off now, but thank you so, so much for this. Thanks, Deandra. That was a really succinct point. Wonderfully done. And uh, good luck with your next meeting. Dina, I'll leave it up to you as to whether we take another question or two or whether we leave it there, because I note that we have just gone over time. We are out of over time. We do have an extremely packed program, so so I'm reluctant for us to go any further. I'm sorry, but those were incredibly interesting um, talks. Um, a couple of the panelists have put their email addresses into the chat, so maybe I can invite the audience to to email questions and invite the rest of the panelists who are happy to receive questions that way to stick their email contacts in the chat. Um, thank you to all of our panelists. It's been an extraordinary discussion. It's been incredibly interesting. Um, thank you to all of our audience for being here. We have a um, another panel coming up in a little bit less than half an hour. Um, Alessandra Gierda is going to be talking about biosafety measures, technology risks and the world trade organization. This might feel like a very different topic but it actually sort of isn't. And thinking about the ways in which um, children and youth engage in different kinds of multilateral organizations and negotiations, of course, is something we need to do in every space. There isn't a space that isn't about youth and children. So come back 12 noon um, Central European time. Um, and again, thank you to this excellent panel. Thank you to Aoife for coordinating it. Uh, thank you to the Office um, of the High Commissioner on Human Rights for hosting us as a uh, Hannah and Santa Cruz dialogue. And see you all in 25 minutes. Thank you so much, everybody.